It has often been claimed that there has been very little change in the average real income of American households over a period of decades. It is an undisputed fact that the average real income, that is, money income adjusted for inflation, of American households rose by only 6% over the entire period from 1969 to 1996. That might well be considered to qualify as stagnation. But it is an equally undisputed fact that the average real income per person in the United States rose by 51% over that very same period. How can both these statistics be true? Because the average number of people per household was declining during those years. The average number of persons per household varies over time as well as varying from one racial or ethnic group to another at a given time, and varying from one income bracket to another. Income comparisons using household statistics are far less reliable indicators of standards of living than our individual income data, because households vary in size, while an individual always means one person. Studies of what people actually consume, that is, their standard of living, show substantial increases over the years, even among the poor, which is more in keeping with a 51% increase in real per capita income than with a 6% increase in real household income. But household income statistics present golden opportunities for fallacies to flourish, and those opportunities have been seized by many in the media, in politics, and in academia. A Washington Post writer, for example, said, the incomes of most American households have remained stubbornly flat over the past three decades, suggesting that there had been little change in the standard of living. A New York Times writer likewise declared, the incomes of most American households have failed to gain ground on inflation since 1973. The head of a Washington think tank was quoted in the Christian Science Monitor as declaring, the economy is growing without raising average living standards. Sometimes such conclusions arise from statistical naivete, but sometimes the inconsistency with which data are cited suggests a bias. Longtime New York Times columnist Tom Wicker, for example, used per capita income statistics when he depicted success for the Lyndon Johnson administration's economic policies and family income statistics when he depicted failure for the policies of Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush. Families, like households, vary in size over time from one group to another and from one income bracket to another. A rising standard of living is itself one of the factors behind reduced household size over time. Increased real income per person enables more people to live in their own separate dwelling units instead of with parents, roommates, or strangers in a rooming house. Yet a reduction in the number of people living under the same roof as a result of increased prosperity can lead to statistics that are often cited as proof of economic stagnation. In a low-income household, increased income may either cause that household's income to rise above the poverty level or cause overcrowding to be relieved by having some members go form their own separate households which in turn can lead to statistics showing two households living below the poverty level where there was only one before. Such statistics are not inaccurate, but the conclusion drawn can be fallacious. Differences in household size are very substantial from one income level to another. U.S. Census data show 39 million people living in households whose incomes are in the bottom 20% of household incomes, and 64 million people living in households in the top 20%. Under these circumstances, measuring income inequality or income rises and falls by households can lead to completely different results from measuring the same things with data on individuals. Comparing households of highly varying sizes can mean comparing apples and oranges. 
Not only do households differ greatly in the numbers of people per household at different income levels, the number of working people varies even more widely. In the year 2000, the top 20% of households by income contained 19 million heads of households who worked, compared to fewer than 8 million heads of households who worked in the bottom 20% of households. These differences are even more extreme when comparing people who work full-time and year-round. There are nearly six times as many such people in the top 20% of households as in the bottom 20%. Even the top 5% of households by income had more heads of household who worked full-time for 50 or more weeks a year than did the bottom 20%. In absolute numbers, there were 3.9 million heads of household working full-time and year-round in the top 5% of households, and only 3.3 million working full-time and year-round in the bottom 20%. There was a time when it was meaningful to speak of the idle rich and the toiling poor, but that time has long passed. Most households in the bottom 20% by income do not have any full-time year-round worker, and 56% of these households do not have anyone working even part-time. Some of these low-income households contain single mothers on welfare and their children. Some such households consist of retirees living on Social Security or others who are not working or who are working sporadically or part-time because of disabilities or for other reasons. Household income data can therefore be very misleading, whether comparing income differences as of a given time or following changes in income over the years. For example, one study dividing the country into five equal layers by income reached dire conclusions about the degree of inequality between the top and bottom 20% of households. These equal percentages of households, however, were by no means equal percentages of people, since the poorest fifth of households contained 25 million fewer people than the fifth of households with the highest incomes. Increasing income inequality over time also becomes much less mysterious in an era when people are paid more for their work, because this means that people who don't work as much or at all lose opportunities to share in this income rise. In addition to differences among income brackets in how many heads of household work, there are even larger differences in how many total members of households work. The top 20% of households have four times as many workers as the bottom 20%, and more than five times as many full-time, year-round workers. No doubt these differences in the number of paychecks per household have something to do with the differences in income, though such facts often get omitted from discussions of income disparities and inequities caused by society. The very possibility that the problem is not in society, but in people who contribute less than others to the economy and are correspondingly less rewarded, is seldom mentioned, much less examined. But not only do households in the bottom 20% contribute less work, they contribute far less skills based on education. While nearly 60% of Americans in the top 20% graduated from college, only 6% of those in the bottom 20% did so. Such glaring facts are often omitted from discussions which center on the presumed failings of society and resolutely ignore facts counter to that vision. Most statistics on income inequality are very misleading in yet another way. These statistics almost invariably leave out money received as transfers from the government in various programs for low-income people, which provide benefits of substantial value for which the recipients pay nothing. Since people in the bottom 20% of income recipients receive more than two-thirds of their income from transfer payments, leaving those cash payments out of the statistics greatly exaggerates their poverty 
and leaving out in-kind transfers as well, such as subsidized housing, distorts their situation even more. In 2001, for example, cash and in-kind transfers together accounted for 77.8% of the economic resources of people in the bottom 20%. In other words, the alarming statistics on their income so often cited in the media and by politicians count only 22% of the actual economic resources at their disposal. Given such disparities between the economic reality and the alarming statistics, it is much easier to understand such apparent anomalies as the fact that Americans living below the official poverty level spend $1.75 for every dollar of income, as their income is defined in statistical studies. As for stagnation, by 2001, most people defined as poor had possessions once considered part of a middle-class lifestyle. Three-quarters of them had air conditioning, which only a third of all Americans had in 1971. 97% had color television, which less than half of all Americans had in 1971. 73% owned a microwave, which less than 1% of Americans owned in 1971, and 98% of the poor had either a video cassette recorder or a DVD player, which no one had in 1971. In addition, 72% of the poor owned a car or truck. Yet the rhetoric of the haves and the have-nots continues, even in a society where it might be more accurate to refer to the haves and the have-lots. No doubt there are still some genuinely poor people who are genuinely hurting, but they bear little resemblance to most of the millions of people in the often cited statistics on households in the bottom 20%. Much poverty is imported across the southern border of the United States that immigrants cross, legally or illegally, from Mexico. Homeless people, some disabled by drugs or mental problems, are another source of many people living in poverty. However, the image of the working poor, who are falling behind as a result of society's inequities, bears little resemblance to the situation of most of the people earning the lowest 20% of income in the United States, however much such rhetoric may be fashionable in the media and elsewhere. The problem is not a stagnation of the national economy, but particular economic and social problems of particular groups of people.